So I loved my conversation with the brothers in the foyer, three black members of the church with stories to tell, testimonies of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. And I left after the conversation thinking, these are my brothers, right? These are my brothers in Christ. And despite the differences in our immutable characteristics, I have a strong connection with them. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications and go to quickmedia.com, that's cwicmedia.com, and sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Quick Week, there at the top. Here we go. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we've brought on the brothers in the foyer, foyer, however you want to pronounce it, Andrew, Will, and Isaiah. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, you guys have got a new podcast, new YouTube channel. I want to go over that a little bit, Brothers in the Foyer. Tell me about how that started and what you guys are trying to accomplish. Andrew, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, Brothers in the Foyer was something that commenced when we were at the, the Draper Temple. Um, we were sitting in the parking lot and discussing about our experience in the temple. Uh, we may go into that a little bit later, but... Um, we expressed just how our feelings of our of how there's not enough positive content out there about the church. And then on top of another layer, there's not a lot of content of black members of the church as well. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to change that and be able to put something positive out there in the, in the sphere. And so um, we kind of came all together about six or seven of us. Um, and we discuss and share our thoughts because when we all came together, we would always talk, we would talk for hours on end. We're like, man, we talk about some really good topics. What if we shared this to other people? Cause we think that if we shared our testimonies and our experiences with other people, it may open their ears and maybe even open their hearts as well. And so, um, that has been something that's been really, uh, something I've been really wanting to be a part of as well. But then also we want to help other people who are outside of the church to be able to see, yes, this is a diverse church. This is the Lord's church and that the gospel is something that reaches everyone, no matter what skin, skin tone you are. Um, my testimony is more than skin deep, obviously, but it's cool for people to see when they first see me, they see who I am. And then they also hopefully see the savior in my, in my testimony as well. Yeah, and that's important. I mean, there's just, that's the way we all work as human beings. I mean, that's that's right. an important thing. Uh, you guys, so you're in the temple or at the temple parking lot. Is this something you guys do a lot? You guys get together and do this at the temple? or? Yeah, we strive to, obviously. I mean, we have a, a pretty full schedule. And so trying to coordinate, it's it's been hard. But that first time we all actually met together in person, or I met Will for the first time. I've known Isaiah for a few years, but uh, meeting Will for the first time and a few others, um, it was a great opportunity. And yeah, that experience was pretty good. I can let Isaiah or Will uh, explain what happened that day. <laughs> they, yeah, most definitely. Um, like you said, we were we had just finished up our um, temple session. We went in for endowments. Um, and for people that don't know, um, endowments is just, or one fundamental belief of our faith is we believe that family relationships extend beyond the grave. So we go into the temple and perform those um, sacred ordinance for um, our deceased um, relatives. And so we had just finished. We're in the temple parking lot and we're going over just discussing like how our overall experience was in the temple. And we felt that um, from beginning, walking in and going out, we all noticed that we were getting like special attention. Now for Will, it'll be different because Will is a large man. Like he's like dang near seven foot, you know, so he'll get looked at <laughs> and treated a certain way no matter where he goes. But yeah, we just felt like um, it started as we were in the ceiling room. Well, not say started, but kind of like the capstone was placed when we were in the ceiling room. And like there That's were true. several ordinance workers that came up to us individually and like shook our hands and thanked us for being there. And so when we got into the temple parking lot, we discussed like how our feelings were about that. You know, we felt like, um, yeah, at the time we were the only um, black men in the temple and we felt like we were treated a bit differently. Not that it was a bad thing. Right. But, um, you know, we go to the temple just like everyone else. And we were just like, you know, there's really no need for 
like special attention. And so another thing adding to what Andrew said is we wanted to be able to share our experiences, but share how, you know, our experiences should be like all inclusive as black members of the church. You know, we should feel and be treated um, just like every other member um, that's a member of the church. And so even though we are grateful that people are thanking us for being in the temple, um, we just kind of came together and decided, like, let's share our experiences. Let's share, like, we need to kind of break that barrier of, like, um, the diversity and the feelings that are um, shared through us just being different, you know? All right. Well, cool. William? Well, yeah, just kind of normalizing that experience and, you know, uh, making sure that everyone knows, you know, we're here, we're we're aware of what's going on and we we want to, you know, uh, uh, combat that, share our testimonies. And um, yeah, that's kind of one of the main reasons why I wanted to, you know, continue on this this brotherhood is, is to help others come unto Christ. That's the ultimate goal. That's what we do as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, it's it's been an amazing experience being with, with these brothers, especially Isaiah and Andrew, and learning from them and hearing their testimonies and their opinions about different topics and things like that. So Awesome. And so be a little bit more specific about when you guys do get together for these podcasts, because I've watched a couple of them, you're, you're, you've got a big table area, you all get up around it and you just kind of go, which I really like, right? I try to make this podcast as much that way as possible, where it's like people can just eavesdrop in on these conversations. And, right. and that is, that's, yes. I think that's the, it's like what they call long form, you know, uh, recordings or, you know, uh, you just, you're not trying to be commercialized with it or have a script. You just, you just go. And that's the funnest thing to listen to. But what are some of the specific topics that you guys usually end up talking about on the podcast? Uh, we, we actually just had a our episode just dropped on Friday um, where we discussed of just a few potential questions that may be, uh, um, can you be active and not go to church or also why are people taking a break from the church? Um, we all know people who who've left the gospel or, or just left the church and we don't feel that they belong there anymore. We kind of dive into that and share our perspectives on that. Um, our experiences as being black members of the church, positive and negative. Um, and we, I mean, we have so many other topics we want to go into. We plan on talking about fatherhood um, talking about how to balance that life of being a good father and a good husband and also being a member of the church, mental health. There's just so many topics that we've yet to cover, but we mm -hmm. plan on to covering those uh, as well because I feel like personally for me, I, and I think this is a kind of across the board for all of us that we kind of have this alignment um, where we didn't really have the best upbringing or the most ideal upbringing mm -hmm. as most members of the church do. Um and so we want to be able to provide what we weren't, what we didn't have, you know? So if, so if there can be some positive content out there, so I have, I have two nephews at home um, or back home in, in Kansas that are young men, they're growing or young men, but they don't have fathers. Mm -hmm. And so if I could have some, if I can help put out content that could be able to be influence, a uh, positive influence for them rather than the stuff that's on TV and put light into the world that's full of darkness. I mean, that, I think that's probably our ultimate goal. And that's been a big motivation for me. Awesome. Yeah. Go Cheeks. Our format, or oh, if you don't mind, <laughs> I was going to, yeah, Big Cheese. Both, so Andrew and I both are, well, I'm from the Missouri side. And so, yeah, <laughs> okay. Kansas City is where we at. Um, but yeah, our format really came from, um, I feel like we established it when we were celebrating Andrew's birthday at a buffet. And we were all just sitting around a table and we were just talking. And like yeah. we were just talking for hours on various subjects. Um, and so, that's where we were like, man, like, let's just have our podcast be like a barbershop, right? Where you could just sit around a table, you can discuss various um, topics. And that's when we noticed um, that that was like the best way for us to do this podcast, like focus, have a subject, right? But just have it be barbershop talk and us share our personalized experiences. Right. So uh, Give me a little bit of a little bit of a, an idea of each of your backgrounds. Well, we're going to start with you. Are you? You guys are all in Utah now. Um, where, where did you? Did you? Were you, uh, you two, uh, Isaiah and Andrew? You both said that you're you're from the Kansas City area. 
Will, where are you from and what brought you to where you were? And, and have you always been a member of the church? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, was born, uh, came out here to Utah around the age of 13. Uh, and my family moved into Holiday. We were by far the only black family there at the time. Um, and uh, kind of what brought us out here to Utah was uh, my mom is a, well, was a traveling nurse at the time. And uh, she was looking for a better opportunity. And uh, my siblings, my older siblings were already out here. So they kind of tested it out a little bit for us and uh, had nothing but great things to say, to say about Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, but uh Currently, I reside in Lehigh, uh, Utah right now, and uh, that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. And uh, I have uh, a wife and two two children. So awesome. But but you're and, and you were always a member of the church, you said? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I've uh, been a member. I was baptized when I was eight by my older brother. Uh, my mom is actually the my mom and dad. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to baptize my dad. Um but my mom joined back in 1997 and okay. uh, we were attracted out by missionaries um, who were actually in the neighborhood to look for a member referral that they had received. Um, and that member referral wasn't at home. And so they decided to, you know, keep knocking and, and looking and uh, they stumbled upon our, our family of, of six kids. So it was, it was a, uh, I feel like I feel very special um, to to be a part of the gospel, and uh, it means so much to me. Um, and I'm I'm eternally grateful for those missionaries for being diligent and and following the spirit to keep going. So that's kind awesome. of how. Awesome, yeah. Andrew. Uh, what about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I hail from the exotic land of Topeka, Kansas. Uh, <laughs> Definitely not in Kansas anymore. I've heard every joke under the sun about it. You know, <laughs> Kansas is so flat. You can step on top of a tuna can and see across the state. I've heard it all. But uh, yeah, I've, I've, I was out there my whole life. I uh, was born in the gospel. Uh, my mother and my father were converts. Uh, my mother first, well, actually it was my grandmother on my mother's side. Um, she was living out in Washington of all places, or it was Idaho. It was one of the two. And missionaries knocked on her door and um, she went through the lessons and uh, became a member. And then she shared it with my mom, who obviously uh, was in a place in a, that was looking for things. She kind of had a Joseph Smith experience where she was looking for truth and she tried everywhere. She tried every religion you can think of, but haven't didn't hear about Mormons or heard about Latter-day Saints. And so um, she was able to speak with the missionaries and they gave her some answers, especially about the life after, because she lost her previous husband um, in a tragic uh, accident, car accident. And so um, they provided some answers that gave her some some insight that really helped her and her children fo kind of followed suit, you know. Um, and then my she met my father and they were converted uh, or he was converted and was able to change his life as well. And then they came together and made me. Um, and so I've been, uh, being able to see the gospel and I feel like I still am a convert. You know, I feel like even though you're born in the gospel to get that testimony and be able to stay there and really be converted, um, is, I, f I feel like is really important to, to, to know. Um, and I had my experience, I think as a teenager, um, I was able to see both sides of the fence and being able to test the waters and realize, okay, if I do this, this I'm not going to have really good, uh, consequences. So, yeah. um, and, you know, I think I've I've learned, I think when you have those issues or go through um, opposition, I think that's where you really get rooted and you learn and you see where you stand. Um, I think that's what's really important. Yeah, but, none uh, of us are perfect. And, and uh, you know, many of us make bad decisions. And, for sure. <laughs> and, and eventually say, okay, wait a minute, maybe these things I'm learning, these principles are not just like these churchy things, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, yeah, this might really be real and important in my <laughs> life because the consequences over here suck. They're horrible, right, right. you know? It's sad, but, but so many people go through, go through it so much and they don't, they never take a, take a step back and like, okay, is, am I going to go this, go through this every single time and go through that infinite cycle, you know? But, um, 
really it's just trying to be a chain breaker. And, you know, um, I was the first, first person in my family to serve a mission. Um, first family member to have kids without, without outside of marriage. It's just a lot of kind of pioneer things. I think these brothers, uh, here also are pioneers in their own way as well. But, um, yeah. And so I, I've, uh, I was living in Kansas for about 20 odd years, 23, 24 years. And I moved out to Utah because that environment was just negative. And I wanted to be somewhere where I can be able to um, thrive and just be around some more positive influences. Um, obviously, there's issues wherever you go, wherever state you go, you can't run from it. Mm -hmm. But it was a little bit easier for me to be around some some people that were more like minded. Also, mission companions and friends that were uh, on the same path as me. And so I met, met my wife. Um, we've been married for eight years now. I have three. I'm a father of three. Well, technically one, but I have twins on the way. Awesome. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been great. I live down in Spanish Fort currently. Well, life's going to be uh, even busier for you here shortly. Then. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, I'm still trying to wrap my brain my brain around it. Yeah, Isaiah, how about yourself? Yeah. So for me. Um... So I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, all my roots are there. Mom and dad's side of the family resides in Kansas City. Um, both of my parents, they were baptized members of the church um, prior to me being born. Um, I have one older brother who was baptized when he was eight. Um, and then when I was around six years old, my parents divorced. And so I was actually raised in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. And so, yeah, I grew up um, outside of the church when my parents divorced, my mom went inactive, um, my dad went inactive. And I just kind of grew up like any ordinary child, you know. Um, and then for me, I just got to a point um, where I had made so many bad decisions. Um, I noticed my decisions were not only affecting myself, but they were affecting the people around me. Um, and this happened like when I was around 23. 23 years old. Um, so I was like my, in my second year in college. And um, that's when I had like the come to Jesus moment. Um, after making so many bad decisions, I was like, look, I need to find out like who God is. Cause at the time, like I believed in God, but I didn't know like who God was or um, I had heard about Jesus. I went to church a couple of times as a youth Um and knew like there was some importance there, but just didn't know really what it was. And that's when I went back home uh, one summer from college. I picked up a Bible, read it. Um, and my dad ended up telling me that my mom and him were baptized members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That they so were you, didn't, you didn't know that before? I had no idea. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had no idea. Um, and from there... Um, he told me to ask my mom about the Book of Mormon. So I went and asked her about it. And she had a copy of it sitting on her dresser. And I had always seen it, but I never asked her what it was. Mm -hmm. And it had no words on it. It was like an older copy. It just had the Angel Moroni on there. Yeah, yeah, that light blue one. And so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. And so, yeah, I picked it up. I read it. Because um, at the time, I was searching for a church to go to. Um, but at that point, I read it and just felt it was true. Like everything in it for me just was common sense, right? Like when you know something, you just know. Um, I felt like what really attracted me to it was just the story of it being an ancient text of the um, for Native Americans, right? That's kind of like what captivated me to it, the historical context. And from there, um, my mom invited over a family friend of hers um, that was there who was a member in Georgia. And he brought over missionaries. And on that first meeting, they invited me to be baptized and I accepted it. Mm. And at that point, though, I had already read the Book of Mormon front to back. So like I was just ready, you know, to to kind of make that next step. And yeah, so I met that made that next step. I was baptized at 23. Um, I went and served a mission in Jamaica Kingston Mission at 24. Mm -hmm. And I had met my wife. Um, prior to going on my mission, we, we met through a Facebook, um, group and we kept in touch throughout my mission. And when I came home, I moved out here to Utah to go to school with the intention to move back to Georgia originally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but I got stuck here. Um, Utah really grew on me while I was here dating my wife and 
yeah, that's how I ended up here in Utah. So I currently reside in West Jordan and um, I got two beautiful boys who both were born out in California. We did about a three year stint in California for work. And so my journey has just been in the gospel anyways. Um, I feel like I have the complete experience of knowing like what the atonement is like, because like I lived in the dark, like without the gospel for, you know, 23 years of my life. And now I have the remainder of my life to to kind of live in a light, you know. And so for me, there's really no um, turning back. Like I've experienced that change because I know how I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the things that I used to be or the things that I used to do, rather, like um, there's always that temptation. Right. But like, I don't want to do it because I know what I'm living for now. So I've got to experience like that complete dy- opposite dynamic. You know, I'm interested to know, Isaiah, when you when you went on your mission, I'll, I because I have a I have a similar story to yours. Right. And And so. I I decided when I I had a kind of come to Jesus meeting also and um it was pretty fierce and everything changed for me after that moment and uh so I started studying I read the book of Mormon and I had already been a member my entire life I'd gone to church my you know my entire life but I decided when I was going on a mission that I was going to become a different person mm-hmm. like I'm like like I am going to be a different person and I'm going to do it by giving up everything about me now, right? I, I've got to, and, and that's not an, you know, most people don't change. It's very hard to change who you are. I am an absolutely different person than I was when I was a teenager. I mean, completely different person yeah, as you should. because I just, I was just like, <laughs> yeah. I, and I know that we all mature and everything else, but I was, I mean, I was a loner. I was a surfer guy and, uh, you know, I was, I was just, you know, I still surf, but I, it was you know, I was a completely different. Person. Did you feel that way when you went on your mission, like being having that so fresh, that kind of experience, so fresh, and wanting to go on a mission? I'm guessing about a year later or so. Most, most definitely, it's it's crazy because um, I don't want to expose myself too much, but like I was living a life that you would, you know, the drinking, the you know, you know, sex, like, and so for me to go from that type of lifestyle and into a mission where I'm completely surrounded around, you know, brothers and sisters that just, you can see that light in them. Like this is something that they've held and, or at least have known about and have lived. Um, For me at that point, I feel like because I had known where I'd been, the change for me was like, I don't want to say instantaneous. I'm I'm like Andrea, like I'm still being changed. But it was like at that point, there was um there was like just no going back. Like this is like who I am now. Like I'm in an environment and I'm around people that are in the gospel and that are striving to be better. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was just like, look, I've done all my bad. Now it's like just do good. You know? So like my mission was okay, now I'm doing good. Now I can help others. I can share my journey and my story um, about how I was, you know, into these type of things and activities and how now I don't even want to do it anymore because, you know, the Savior has truly, I've experienced that power. Like you just mentioned, it's so hard to change, but like it's easier to change when we invite the Savior in and he literally gives us that change of heart. Like that change of heart is very, very literal. Right. And that's like the one thing that um, I experienced, like in my mission and, and a little bit prior to my mission that um, is, yeah, helped me really conform to where I needed to, to what I needed to do, you know, going forward. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you were on a mission, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you feel at all when you left on your mission? Did you have any feeling of a, uh, like an imposter syndrome kind of at all? Or or were you like, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm completely ready. And, you know, I'm not out of place here. I felt a little out of place at first. I mean, I was ready. I was both feet in, but I was like, I I don't think most of these people around me have been who I've been behind. Right. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I had to have a, the thing was before I went on my mission, like my mom sat down with me and she's like, you need to have a testimony of it. I, it seems like most majority of missionaries go out without a testimony. 
you know, they, they actually find it on their mission, mm -hmm. but I had to, I personally am just a person. I don't want to sell something or market for anything or do anything. If I don't believe in the product or whatever I'm selling or sharing with someone, unless I'm a hundred percent behind it. And so I had to have my own moment of praying and seeking and knocking about the scriptures, about the book of Mormon, about all the things in with church history. And I had to get on my knees and, and I had to ask because I wasn't going to go out and use, spend two years of my life for something I didn't believe in. I, I, I just, I was not going to do that. My mom didn't want me to do that either. And so she's like, Andrew, you really need to get on your knees and pray. And my mom has instilled so many great things in me um, just for, for her always bugging me to pray about things and always pay my tithe. But um, yeah, when I went out on my mission, I felt like I understood the gospel. Um to an extent, you know, I was definitely just a little infant and just milk. Just I saw I could digest at the time. But as I was going through my mission, I grew and I understood and I, I, I my understanding of the gospel deepened and it became a huge anchor in it and a pivot point for me as well for my life. Um, I've seen so many miracles and so many, so many different things that helped me now years later that I can always rely on because I'm like, man, whenever my faith is tested, I'm like, I saw this. I experienced this. I've yeah. seen these people's lives literally change before my eyes. How could that not be? How can this not be true? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, but to, to answer your question, to be an imposter, I don't feel like I was that. Um, but I definitely, when I was sitting in the MTC, laying on my bunk bed, looking up at the ceiling, I was like, am I really about to go do this? I don't know if I can do this. But uh, something within me was keeping me going and staying there. And I think that was those those rich experiences. I mean, I had so many tender mercies. I could go on for hours about the things I saw and the little tidbit things that my father and having provided for me to keep me going when when days were tough. And yeah, we haven't we haven't done an episode on that yet, but I hope we we can go we in depth on, we on our, our missions because there's some fun. There's some good stuff. There's always yeah. there's always a ton of stories. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> good and bad. <laughs> hey, we're, yeah, exactly. Hey, so well, moving on in our lives here a little bit beyond the mission. What you said you're married with two kids? Yeah, two kids. Okay. So what what do you think? What is that? I know this just kind of sounds kind of rhetorical. It's like it's obvious, but um, I'm married. I've got four kids. They're all adults now. So I'm a little beyond where you guys are. Well, a lot beyond where you guys are. But you know, something that I learned is, Kate, that the mission was such an important anchor for me because I changed who I was. Yes. But then getting married and having kids, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, now I have to really be responsible, <laughs> right? Now I'm really responsible. I have to stretch myself and I'm living for other people. And But the thing it does in return for me, what it did is it gave me guardrails, kind of, because it's like, I have, I can't make this decision or that decision over there because I've got these people relying on me. You know, I've, I've, I've got to, I've got to stay down this path because these people rely on me. I, I'm sure you can, uh, well, you, you can empathize with that. Oh, for sure. Most definitely. I think, uh, going, kind of going back to my childhood, uh, my, my parents separated at, when I was five. Um, yeah, I was and so, six. Wow. Um, so uh, as you know, Greg, like that's, that's a hard experience, you know, as a young man, you're looking for father figures, you know, my dad was kind of in and out of our lives and, uh, it was really tough for me. Uh, I, I held a lot of resentment and anger towards him, um, just because, you know, I, I wanted certain things from him. I wanted that relationship. And so I think kind of like Isaiah, like, I, I saw how that was for me as a kid. And so my main motivation every day, day in and day out, uh, regardless of what I'm doing with my kids and even my wife, um, I make sure I give full attention to them and uh, I make sure that I do it with all my heart. And uh, that's kind of my biggest motiva motivation and uh, it's just to you know, emulate that love and, uh, and, and, and show, you know, um, my kids, you know, that they have a father that cares and love for loves them. Yeah. And um, I think through that whole entire experience, um, you know, going so long without a father, there were definitely, 
young man leaders and and people that you know stepped up like my older brother um and and people like him but most importantly gaining that connection with with our father in heaven i realized heavenly father was my father and and that really changed my whole entire perspective um on on life and and the way i did things so it's amazing how the gospel blesses everyone it's just changes everybody isaiah so let's get to the next subject here being black and a member of the church right so i i don't sometimes i feel and we talked about this before we got started i kind of feel like are we post-racial yet in a sense right is it like do we even talk about this but i'm sure this is something that you guys talk about you know because you have a different experience still than most members of the church do where are we at do you feel i mean we can go back to 1978 what are we, 30, 45, 46 years later here? And most of you have got similar experiences or the people, the guys, the gals that are your age have got probably somewhat of a similar example of if your parents were members, they were probably converts, Yeah, right? And, and, and then you guys are kind of the first ones that come through and maybe you were young when you were converted or you're, You've been in the church your whole life. So there's that that that's different. But I th I think sometimes, because I've thought about this a lot, um, I, it, it's almost like it's, it, it, there there is some type of excitement to that, isn't there? I mean, I understand there's an adversity to it, but it's like, it's almost like the whole window's been opened more recently. And there it's, I don't know, the potential just seems amazing to me. The, of of what could happen among the African American communities, for example, not not to mention Africa or anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, you know, I'll be completely honest. My experience as a black man in the church so far, um, pertaining to members, I I personally, in the, I've been a member what ten years now, two thousand fourteen, thirteen, just a little over eleven eleven years. Um, I have had no negative experiences with members so far. My experiences have been more so with Black people in my community, <laughs> like um, trying to help them understand or struggling with them, like family members and other friends that I have that are Black, and helping them understand that, look, this is an international church, you know, and the reason I feel like it's so emphasized here in America is because yes, in America, we are the minority and you don't just see it, see us um, as members in the church as much as we do Caucasians or say um, Latinos. And um, so my struggle has just been, um, you know, helping others in our community see like, look, this is an all inclusive faith. And yes, there has been some dirt in the history of the church. And so without focusing too much on that because man is imperfect, right? And if you go through any faith, there's gonna be dirt in every faith, right? And so when it comes to us, I just try my best to help people focus on that relationship with the savior, which is like what we all should be striving for, right? Um, the truth is in the doctrine. The truth is knowing that Jesus Christ is the savior. Um, the truth is not in you know, Blacks not been able to hold the priesthood for a certain period of time or um, Blacks been treated a certain way. Um, let me not say Blacks, Black people um, <laughs> in that way. Come on, Isaiah, um, man. Get your vernacular right. Come on. Yeah, let me get my vernacular right. They try, they try um, to change it to our, race in the priesthood now. That's, yes, that's race the, in the priesthood, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, race in the priesthood has and is still a... Um, a big thing for people in our community. And so I would want them to know um, that it is an all-inclusive faith. And if we can just get past what happened in the past and focus on a savior, then they'll see and feel the things that me, Andrew, Will, and all of our other brothers in our podcast feel and see and experience. And it's, it's great, you know? Yeah. Andrew, how about you? What's your, what's your perspective on things? Where, where are we at now at this point in those types of relationships and, and, and moving forward? Right. So this, honestly, this topic has a lot of personal connection for me, at least. Um, 
I'm from Topeka, Kansas, and there's really nothing special out there, but just oh, a Supreme Court case that happened like back in 1954, Brown versus Board mm -hmm. of Education. And that's my family. Linda Brown is my grandmother. Oh, wow. And so understanding about segregation and race relations and how that issues came up, I have living family members who experienced that firsthand. But personally, I have never experienced that, but I've always... I think I always had an eye for it, naturally looking for that. And I found that my mindset became more of a victim than a victor. And I was always focusing on is are people looking at me wrong or are they, they out to get me? Mm -hmm. um, because I think that was kind of ingrained in me from a young age, from the things that I, I saw my parents experience or my great grandmother or my grandmother did. Um, but overall, yeah, similar, like, like Isaiah, I mean, people, I I first always try to look for the right, the good in people first. Um, I think if you approach life that way and seek context, you can usually have a better experience with anyone and everyone. Because I, I I think people may say things or do things, but they, I don't think they always have ill intent. I think they sometimes say things out of ignorance, mm -hmm. or they just they're just genuinely curious and want to know and want to ask. But if we don't give them a safe space to be able to ask that, there's no progress that can be able to be done. Um, Mm -hmm. But in my experience, I mean, uh, yeah, I was, I'm, I think all three of us, we've, we've all grew up in a, grew up in the church and we were like the only black family in the whole ward or even the whole stake. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we always knew eyes were on us. Um, but everyone who I've always interacted with, they've always treated me just the same. There's never been really a stark difference between you're black, I'm white, I'm going to treat you different. No, it's just like we're brothers and sisters and, and, in Christ and we're heavenly father's children. If you see me for who I am on the inside, outside, take care of the outside takes care of itself, you know? And so I think, um, I think as, as a whole, the church has been making a lot of leaps and bounds with the, with like race relations. I feel like with the NAACP and meeting and all this, the, all these things like that, just to show that the church is diverse. And, um, but overall, I believe the, I believe things have been, I think better, or they've tried to make more things more inclusive or more, prevalent in the forefront so people can see that because people believe the church isn't diverse but i mean all three of us we're still standing here we're faithful members we serve in the gospel or serve in the church um if we can overcome the things that happened in the past i'm pretty sure you can be able to do it too it's not impossible and yeah, our faith and is deeper than the skin yeah and, and of course all the growth areas of the church in the world are non-white i mean it's all latin yeah. america africa and the philippines yeah, brazil's growing up blowing up man it's yeah. it's crazy yeah, it's coming out. Will, how about yourself? Uh yeah, I mean, it's uh I, I've definitely had my experiences, you know, in the church, um, in the church, outside the church. And I think uh some kind of like Isaiah and Andrew, uh, especially what Isaiah said about, you know, dealing with, you know, other blacks and other black people uh out there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of my experience more so. Uh, my cousins that are not members or aunts and uncles, you know, that have, you know, dug up anti-literature and, and things mm -hmm. like that, you know. Um, but I would say if, overall, if we're looking overall, you know, it, it's been an amazing experience as far as, you know, living the gospel and, and being a part of God's true church on this earth. And I, I really believe that. I believe that we are here for a reason. Uh, I My mission, just like Isaiah and Andrews and yours, uh, Greg, it really changed my life. Uh, if I didn't serve a mission, who knows where I would be today. Um, but it Man. really <laughs> changed my, my view of life and how I view others. And so having that focus on Jesus Christ, that's what's important, you know, and, and we can talk about how we can combat racism in the church, outside the church, in our communities. But I think the most important focus is Jesus Christ. That's that's why we're doing what we do. Well, you know, I, I really like what, when was it, two years ago, I think now, maybe? Um, President Nelson went over a talk in his, uh, I think it was a YSA talk. And he was talking about what I, I call it President Nelson's identity hierarchy. Oh, yeah. I, how you identify yourself. Yeah. yeah. And he, and he yeah. goes over those three, right? It's like, okay, I'm a child of God, number one. Uh, I am a dis, uh, a child of the covenant, number two, and, and number three, I'm a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he's like, everything else is is down below, and it's not like they don't exist, right? I mean, I mean, I've got an ethnicity, I've got a race, 
uh, I've got a sexual orientation. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I've yeah. got all these other roles and identities that are, are make up who I am, but they're all subordinate, right, to those top three. Mm -hmm. And if we can focus on those three, it seems to me like that's kind of more of a path toward race relations. That's a path toward Zion, right? It's it's yeah, like, right. yeah, these other things are there. You know, it's interesting. I'll bring up a couple of quick examples. I had, uh, they're both from South Africa because I've got friends over there. And I, I was talking to this really, really sharp girl, a member of the church. She's a return missionary. And, and so I started talking about being colorblind, right? As compared, you know, kind of like more of the Martin Luther King approach of, you know, it's, it's about the color or the character, not the color of my skin, the color and, and my kid's character. And my, you know, hopefully my kids will, will, will be able to get along with your kids, but character, not color skin. And the other side is there seems to be a real push to divide based on skin color. Mm. And she said, well, I, and I asked her that, I said, do you, do you, you know, cause she's got a different experience there in South Africa than we have here. She's like, do you, would you profess like colorblindness? And she says, you know, up to a certain point, right? Because there is a history that she has there. Um, there is persecution that she experienced. There is an identity to her that is wrapped up in that, yeah. right? And where she comes from and everything else is like, okay, so no, I, I do, but only to a certain point, right? What, what I look at complete colorblindness. So I thought that that was, I mean, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? I personally, uh, I feel that there's, yeah, there's so many things that we identify as of, yeah, of that whole list of your sharing, but I feel like once we, if we fully understand of who we are and whose we are, identifying, yes, I am a child of God, everything, yeah, it takes care of itself. You know, I, I think it's, it's so important for us to not divide ourselves, but you know, like how, they, they say, um, this place is a melting pot, but I kind of like to look at it as a salad. You know, everybody is their own individual thing, but when they come together, they complement each other. You yeah. can see their colors. You can see the, the, the textures, the taste, and it just, it tastes really good. They all complement each other. And I think that when we, we do see each other, um, that, yeah, we're brothers and sisters. That's a happen That happens to be a black man, a black member of the church in the temple, but in the end, I'm just seeing you for who you are, a son or a daughter of God. And I think yeah. that's the most important. I like that a lot. I think, uh, well, again, and it's like marriage, right? I mean, I, I I don't want my wife to be exactly like me. I want her to be different. And like that, that crucial relationship that's there in marriage is like, it's two people that are very different. And part of the beauty of that, because there is a beauty to it, is, yeah. you know, crossing those bridges between each other. And learning from each other and complimenting each other. And 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 so that's certainly part of it. Isaiah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually want to just uh, move off what you just mentioned as far as like learning from each other. Um, because for me, in every reaction that I have with someone of the opposite race, um I I interact with them and I go into our interactions um as a blank piece of paper, right? And I can only I accept them for who they are. I see them for who they are. And I can only then react to how they would react to me. And so I have had one experience and it's how I choose to deal with any other negative experience I have when it comes to race with another individual. But for instance, if someone, if I'm interacting or having to communicate with a certain person and the issue of my race, because I'm in a position where I'm talking with multiple people, um, multiple times a day, you know, with the career that I'm in. And so for me, I have to have like an unbiased, you know, when I go into my interactions. And so as I do approach it and I do have, let's say a negative experience or communication with someone and it's in regards to my race, I take it as a learning opportunity and or a teaching moment for that person, depending on how ignorant they want to be, <laughs> you know? So it's like, why would you say that? Like, what is there something I said or did that would make you say something like so ignorant, you know, not get offended right away, not mm -hmm. brash out at them, but just really take it as a teaching moment to help them see, like, look, we should be seeing each other the same. Like, why do you have a certain prejudice in your heart, you know, about me um, or about the way I look, you know, like what will cause you to react that way to really help that person look inwardly, you know, about why they're reacting that way. 
So like you said, Greg, I feel like we should take moments and it could be hard because I know like Will, I know Will have shared some experience he's had that were pretty rough experience when it comes to racism, you know, and so for me, I haven't had that experience. So I feel like I'm a little bit more patient when it comes to dealing with people that are ignorant in that aspect. And so I can use that as a learning experience for that person to help them look inwardly, because like for me, I'm approaching everyone with, you know, like I said, like a blank piece of paper until they show me something different. Right. Uh, Mandry, were you going to say something? Sorry, I was going to, I was, Isaiah, you're all, we're same thing, man. Like, I, I, I think it's so important to approach people that same way because it's that golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. I'm like, if I don't want someone to judge me instantly because they just look at me because of some experience, I shouldn't do the same. You know, I should take my time and say, okay, how, why are you reacting this way? Or is there anything I can help to help you understand on a deeper level? I mean, that, that honestly, when I was on my mission, that was like a full two years. All my companions were white and they always asked me questions. They couldn't feel safe to ask anyone else. But I gave them that space so that they can learn. Mm -hmm. And they went back to their own communities and that helped influence and help who knows how many other people, yeah. you know? That's awesome. Well, you've had some experiences then with racism. I mean, has that affected how you handle things? Definitely. Uh, I think like Isaiah have said, you know, in my earlier years, you know, growing up at Holiday, um, definitely a lot of experiences that, that happened to me in my youth. And, you know, I would react instead of being proactive about it. Um, so now I'm being an a, a adult. Um, I handle things a little bit more differently. So like with Isaiah saying, being a little bit more patient and telling myself like, OK, they, they haven't experienced certain things that I've experienced, you know, and and. And being okay and, and walking away instead of getting upset or being angry. And I think, you know, having that that foundation, knowing who you truly are, changes your whole perspective. And yeah. going to the yeah, temple. Solid ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it gives you a different perspective on life and God's children as well, uh, regardless of their skin color, uh, you know, regardless if they live in a rich neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, you view people in that same light. And and so I've really held on to that as, I, as I've gotten older. Uh, and uh, I think for anyone that's struggling with that, you know, pray and ask Heavenly Father to know your true purpose and he'll reveal that to, to you. And, you know, we, you can read about it. You can go to the temple and, and, and learn about your purpose. And, and having that foundation, that testimony can change a lot of things in this world today, for sure. Well, this has been awesome, guys. You guys are awesome. I, really solid individuals. I, I, it's and, and it's very obvious. So the audience here, I want you to go over and subscribe to their channel and listen to what what they have to offer as they give these little round tables and talking to each other. I think it's fascinating. I think it's great information. It's uh, centered on the Christ. It's centered on their testimonies. It's very positive and. Uh, Andrew, why don't you take it home for us here? Where where can everybody find uh, your YouTube channel? And, and I don't know if you had a podcast as well on that or yeah, we have uh, we have video podcasts in a similar fashion like this, and also we have a little studio that we're trying to get more consistently in person, having us all there. But it's at Brothers in the Foyer, Brothers with a Z in the Foyer, A Z, right? Yeah, A Z. Okay, and uh, that's on all platforms. We're on all audio, Apple, Spotify youtube instagram facebook we're not on tiktok we may be getting on there yet who knows okay. i don't know that's a it's a sketchy area but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah we appreciate you guys for and greg especially for reaching out to us and having us on we're really really excited to uh talk with you and have your viewers being able to get to know us a little bit more yeah well make sure audience everybody go over subscribe to their channels uh, listen to what they have to say. I'm going to put the links there in the description box as well so they can go and click on that and go and subscribe. Andrew, Will, Isaiah, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank uh, thanks you. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been a thanks, pleasure. Greg.